One more time, let's all geek out together. AFI is here, guys. Oh, man. Guys, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Congrats on this album. Uh, you guys uh, have been playing your asses off, by the way. You've been playing a lot of shows, a lot going on. How are things going? How's the fan response been to the music? How does it feel getting it out there finally? Talk to us. It has been fantastic. Yeah. Am I on? I'm on. You're on. You're not as loud as yeah. him. You're not as loud as me. I'm really loud. You, yeah. <laughs> you go ahead. Uh, yeah, I want to see how loud great. everybody is. Let's Check. See. Okay. Check. Hello. Yeah. It's been going really well. <laughs> We've... <laughs> Except this part. Yeah, except uh, up to right thanks now. Thanks a lot. It was just, yeah, well, let's see if we can recover from here. I think uh, we've played so like eight shows so far on this tour. Um, yeah. Eight or nine. Ten. Ten. Several. Yeah. Several. Right. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, it's Several. been a lot of fun so far. Several. All fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Just uh, so good. Is that uh, your favorite part, finally getting it out and sort of releasing it in the wild? Because there's definitely some magic that happens when you're making the music and when you're recording it and putting it together in the studio, but there's something to be said for that sort of mama bird kicks her out of the nest moment where you kind of give it up to the fans and it becomes its, new, its own thing. I mean, initially when we when we started the band and we started playing music, our focus really was the live performance. D recording records was a means of creating something to give to people so they would know the music when we played the shows. I mean, speaking in those days, there were no shows. There were right. parties and garages and um, such town hall events in different towns, but... Um, you know, so the, the performance aspect of it is very important to us and has always been very important to us and is, and is so rewarding. And, and when you work on a record for a year and the songs, you know, become what you want them to be, it's always very, very exciting to go out and actually play them for people and, and get a reaction. And, and hopefully it's, uh, you know, the similar reaction we have when we hear that song and when we perform it. And so far it has been that. Uh, the responses have been really wonderful. Is there a, a tangible difference, I know it's kind of a silly question because 20 years is a long time, but between sort of the early day crowds, the mid day crowds, can you feel different moments in your career where the crowd has sort of felt different or is it that is it that energy? Oh, that of course. I mean, well, I mean, the similarity is an energy that is carried throughout the years because we've been very, very lucky to have such dedicated, loyal fans. Thank you. I mean, you're sitting here listening to us speak. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. I said, I'm like, why is everyone here? <laughs> um, you know, so that similarity has carried us through the years and has brought us, of course, to be able to be here with you now and to have 10 records and be 25 years in. Um, but of course, the, the audience, the audiences have changed aesthetically um, throughout the years as we have musically changed throughout the years. And, you know, if you talk about 25 years ago, there were two different people in the band and we were playing completely different music. Um, so as you go through the eras, you'll see different crowds. We were speaking about this uh, a few weeks back and you'll see um, more women at the shows as the years go on, which is really gratifying um, <laughs> as the ladies have good taste. Um, so yes. I'm still talking. No, it's perfect. It's, it's literally why they're here. So still talking. never never worry about that for a second. I'll stop. Uh, speaking of like the music sort of being different then and, and uh, versus the music now and the fans and all that, you guys have been uh, cutting into some older stuff too. I know you just recently, uh, He Who Laughs Last, I saw you had the prayer position. When you guys are, are putting together your set list, uh, how do you make those decisions to dip into the archive and like, oh, this will go here? Are you looking for things that blend uh, better with the newer stuff? Are you looking for juxtaposition? What are you trying to, to sort of build there? Um, the blending is very difficult because if you're trying to play something like He Who Laughs Last mm -hmm. versus Aurelia, I mean, those things are just apples and oranges. But um, this tour in particular, we've been putting a lot of different songs in the set every night, which is something we haven't done a lot. Even you know, 20 years ago, we weren't really doing that. It was a very static set list, and I think it's been great, and like you know, we're learning songs at Soundcheck that we're gonna play that night. Like we haven't played in 15 years. Like, oh man, how's this go? And it's actually fun, and it's been the fan response has been great. And I think the mix of songs is actually it's worked. Yeah, it's worked really well. When when you saw the He Who Laughs Last, like we we did play a fan club show where we really had um, a representation of songs from out the years, and it was that strange juxtaposition. So you had that vibe at a fan club show, but I. I think Jade in particular has done a great job of giving a continuity in the most recent shows without going so far back as yeah. to 96, um, where it's representative of many years, if not all. Unfortunately, um, we're 
well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, we don't play for two hours um, <laughs> or three hours, and, and we can't really represent all, all the years. And, it would, and it's so starkly different, as we were talking about, if we, yeah. you, know, you could do an, an, uh, 40 minutes from each, from each, like from each yeah. era. Um, of which there are many. Well, for sure. One of the things I think that kind of speaks to the fact that we're here 20, 25 years later is that you guys do evolve and the music does change from release to release. Uh, but it's funny, like if you were to take like one album and compare it to the one right before, it's almost like looking at a picture of yourself and like when you were 25 versus 26. It's like there's differences, but you're not a completely different person. But you do take that picture from 10 years ago, from 15 years ago, and it's like, wow, there, there's so much that's kind of come from there. Uh, I want to talk about this new album, this incredible album. Thank you so much for this. You guys, how many people have already obsessed over this album? I imagine everyone in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The tenth album, uh, you very much achieved sort of like you Star Wars Force Awakened yourself here in that this is this is a very this is an AFI album. You hear it, you know this is you guys, but there's enough exciting and new stuff that you're trying out and sort of pushing forward here. Uh, that, that, that does like, touch all those new elements and make it really, really like, oh, this is, this is fun. When you're approaching a new album like this, uh, do you set a bar of, okay, we've got to push to this point. We've got to, do you try to quantify evolving the sound or no? Does it just happen organically? I mean, we have to push beyond what we've done, which is why we never sound the same. Every record is different because that's one thing I think we just decided upon kind of informally that yeah. we're, we're not going to do that same thing again. We never had a record that sounds like Black Sails because we did Black Sails, you know, and it wouldn't be fair to us artistically to do that. So I think this new record, to me, a good AFI song is a balance between the aggressiveness, the melodicness, the dark, the light, the anthemic, and it's hard to strike that balance. And this, this album specifically, I think we've kind of done a good job of that. You know, it's got a little bit of everything, and it doesn't sound like Very Proud of You. You know, it sounds like a new <laughs> AFI record. Yeah. Precisely. Um, how, how long did you guys uh, take to put this one together? When did you guys start working on it? I mean, we wrote for almost exactly a year, which is weird. I think that's how long we wrote the last one. On it felt we like... We have this weird... We have no timetable, but when a year goes by, all of a sudden, we just all... It's like something in nature. Maybe it's the changing of the seasons. Of the seasons. It's it like the solstice. Be. It's like we are yeah. done now. Yeah. We have completed. Not. This is over. <laughs> yeah. This is over. It's the, Yeah, there's no really distinct moment when when we finish it, it keeps going and going, and we think we might have a record because we we write so many songs every time we go into a, a writing session to to write a record that you know we reach twelve songs very early on, but those aren't necessarily the twelve songs that will make the record. Some of them won't at all. I don't even I, I don't even know if yes, yeah, some of the early songs some of the earliest songs made the record. What were they? Um, uh, Dark Snow. Yeah, I've got them all on my iPod. Dark Snow. Dark Snow Ooh. was one of the first. We're going to come right? back to that in a second. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll come back to it right now. Um, so I, I heard a number that I was wondering if you guys can confirm that I think you might have thrown out in an interview early on. Is it true that for for this release, upwards of sixty songs were written prior to arriving at these fourteen? Over sixty. Over and, sixty. And you know, we wrote on December Underground uh, over a hundred songs, which I all have on my iPod, and I'm not the only one that has them. I'm just listen to them, you know, like myself. Um, but these ones, there was a lot of lack of quality in some of those songs in Smyrna Ground, which is why they didn't make it. But right. a lot of the songs, the 60 that didn't make it, are, in, you know, in my subjective opinion, are really great songs that I would have loved to have on the record. So Yeah, you know. there's, some, there's some heartbreakers that didn't make it. Well, when you listen to this album, and I think you were kind of speaking to this a second ago, is that, yeah, you guys do hit all of those AFI touchstones, the, the, the anthemic, the melodic, the, the aggressive, all of those things are there. Uh, also, like your your British influences, kind of way. Some of these strong songs are just like straight up new wave songs, and they're awesome. Uh, when you guys are picking out those tracks and you're looking at the sixty, are you trying to find that balance, or is it really just this is a great song, it's got to go on the record, and then you put them together and you're like, oh, look at this. Yeah, I think there's a point where we kind of distill that you know large amount of songs down to you know twenty or so that we all agree on. But from there, after we get the you know the eight or nine or ten no-brainers. It's like, how do we flesh it out? What are the three or four that we can put on here? And, and that will really change the way the, you know, the overall direction of the album. So that's always kind of a tough moment. 
Um, <clears throat> to that end, is there a chance, because uh, you said some of them are just sitting on your iPod, well, all of them are sitting on your iPod, is there a chance that we could get like at some point down the road that Beatles anthology release where like there's like a million tracks just and we all just kind of get to bask in all you the find his iPod. I don't. Yeah, if someone's he loses my iPod, his iPod. I don't yeah. know. Internet, you've been given a challenge. Find the iPod. I don't know if anyone wants that like all the AFI B-sides, but I think there's a B-sides album worth of material that I would be proud to have out there. Awesome. Um, I wanted to ask you too and I'm sure you're probably kind of tired of talking about this, but I'd love to get the definitive story. Uh, when I was reading a while ago, AFI, self-titled. I love a self-titled album. Now uh, we're calling it AFI The Blood Album. It's in the parenthetical, it's there, it's official. If you just what, what happened with it? What's, where'd we arrive at this title? How did this come to be? As we were writing the record, as you pointed out, we wrote about 60 songs in some, way mid, some point midway through the process. And I recognized that in the lyrics that I was writing, the word blood was reoccurring. It wasn't something that I was consciously putting in the lyric, but it was reoccurring. And, I mentioned it to Jade, and when we'd finished writing and we had called those songs down to what you hear on the blood record, um, what we were referring to as the blood record, I brought it back up and we decided that it in fact was a good representation that encompassed the general theme and tones of uh, the songs that run through the, the record, and thereby we refer to it as the blood record. And here we are. Here so we are. That came prior to the artwork, or did the artwork? Prior, prior. Yeah, prior to the artwork. Whoa, man. Plosives. Singer, mic technique. Uh, voice it's, of modulation. It is imperative syndrome. that you know it was prior to the artwork. Prior. <laughs> Got it. Your pop screen. Um, I've discovered that I can see myself over there on the screen. It's yeah, I know. I'm not going to look at you all? anymore. Yeah. No, no, you're distracting. Oh, fair there. enough. Well, that's a first. I'll, I'll tell you that right now, but I, I wear that badge with honor. Okay. So. Um, I also read that you guys had done, this was really cool, uh, a four custom like color vinyl release to represent each color of the blood. I was one, uh, not color, to represent each uh, blood type. But I was wondering, did you go like the extra mile and do the Gene Simmons kiss thing and put like a tre No, you guys didn't. Uh, no one wants our blood. Yeah, there no. was an audible, no, no like one. disappointed gasp. We in can't the have that. <laughs> well, you yeah, know, that's actually been blood. done, so it'd probably be. It'd so, be yeah, kind of why do it again? You know? right? If Kiss did it, you know, Metallica did it too, right? Or did they put some? No, they had their album cover was based on a, a, a photo or a painting or an artwork that had sperm and blood that's mixed, which is disgusting. Oh. <laughs> and there was the Kiss comic too, I think, right? When they did the Kiss yeah. comic, and yeah. they all like. The crazy time. Why not? I don't yeah, know why not? anything about why not? this. Why not? Yeah, they the do. One guy's got the tongue. He does. That's all, that's all I know. And there's a kitty cat. That's and a cat. There's a cat. That's kind of really all you need to at this point. Um, so, uh, Jade, you produced the album. Uh, also, uh, I know Matt Hyde was a little bit a part of that process, mm -hmm. too. But I wanted to ask, uh, how did you get hooked up with Matt? And, and what led to that decision? Uh, and kind of how did that work between you two? And how you guys collaborated and such? Well, he, we share our management with Deftones, and so I'd seen Matt around the office, and we had kind of geeked out about the same tech stuff, yeah. and so I had kind of known him that way, and then when we went into this record with me, the idea of me being producer, you know, just to kind of make the transition easier, brought Matt in to kind of engineer slash do some co-production, and I knew that we had already vibed w well together, and we share a lot of the same philosophies on music, and um, he's super easygoing and very easy to work with, so uh, it, yeah, it was nice. So it was great working it with him. It was nice. Yeah. Um, do you see yourself working with him again, or is it, was he there to kind of help you sort of get, get comfortable with the idea of like producing the whole band and stuff like that? Or I mean, I was comfortable with it. Yeah. He was there to, you know, like for, for instance, we did this thing where we'd never done before where he was tracking drums while I was tracking the vocals, because I just wanted to track the vocals with just... Davey and I, yeah. which is something we talked about doing for a long time, and I didn't want anyone else in there. So I was able to do that and also have other stuff happening, you know, so we could keep the re recording process going. Keep it on, on the rails. So that was one of the things that was very helpful having him in there. Talk a little more about that process, that you guys finally got that chance to, to sort of work together and, and hole up in a room and kind of come together. W what was that like uh, after all these years of working together? Was it almost like starting all over again or like a new? No, well, we Quite the opposite. Yeah, we, <laughs> hold, we hold up in this one room, in this attic room, to write the entire record for a year. And then we hold up in the same room to record it. So it's kind of like we never left that room. There was there no forever. definitive moment of change. Interesting. There was no, it's just you, now we're recording. Shift, that are, yeah, yeah, just we kept in, going in and there. going. And we, you know, we've, we've spent so many years and so many hours doing just that. It was, it was so natural. And, you know, Jade knows my voice so well from years and years of of writing and performing and, yeah. you know, just... Except he takes his it. shirt off when he's recording and he keeps it on when we're writing. So that's really the only difference in the two processes. That's true. You could hear that. That comes through in the tracks. Yeah, I think that's the, in the there. The pecs are just, you know, I had them mic'd up. They're lovely. 
<laughs> get the sound bouncing off yeah. of that. Just to, yeah, it was very nice. I emit heat. Yeah. He does, he emits heat. Well, you're in an attic, naturally. I do. They're not known for their ventilation. It's the, it is a hot attic. Yeah. Well, it's like yeah, it yeah. rises, right? No matter yeah. how cold it is outside, it is warm up there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's right next to um, Jessica Biel's like Alpha J restaurant. We, so there's all really? this paparazzi we. outside all the time, like shouting at celebrities. We. So it was, we had to like wait until that was done so we could record. No way. Was there? I guess not. That would be. Late. I was gonna say. Was there ever a moment of like, oh man, this is a lot of chaos and noise. We should incorporate. Like we should mix that really low. Like that's part of the process. Uh, like, uh, well, when you live in LA, like, that's an annoying noise. So is it? Yeah. Yeah. It's not something you want to incorporate. Yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to run down the line. There's so many uh, exciting, fun things that happen on this record that are that are new here, uh, and I think it's easy and uh, to kind of say like, "Oh, I did this and I'm excited about it." But I'd love for each one of you to give us something that somebody else on the record did that you're excited about that maybe either you were surprised by or just like really dig on this album. The uh, first thing that springs to mind is something I was actually just asking about earlier um, within Jade's production of Aurelia, which began just completely stripped down. Were you on an acoustic guitar? In my mind, you were. It was just the two of us. Yeah. I was playing acoustically on an electric guitar. Okay. So he was playing acoustically <laughs> on an electric guitar. It was not plugged in. But um, it started just in that minimal form. And um, I hadn't heard the, the, the O's that you hear in that chorus, which really, really make the chorus. Um, that was entirely Jade. And I asked him, I'm, I'm like, you you did that right? <laughs> like, yeah, I don't remember doing that. He said, "Yeah, I did that." I went home in my room, like, "Oh, did you sneak yeah, in?" He was, yeah. yeah, he was, he was. It's like so they yeah. will never notice. Just sleep, just yeah. sneak it in there. They're right? quite noticeable. Yeah. They're fantastic. Awesome. So yeah. Um, Jade, what about you, man? Um, we have a song called "She Speaks the Language" on this record, and at the end of the song, Hunter does this crazy, basically a bass solo, which I wasn't anticipating. And the first time I heard it, I was like, whoa, bass solo. And then, like, you know, it's, it's cool. It's, like, essentially a bass solo at the end of the song. No, it's actually a really cool moment. Uh, what about you guys? Uh, uh, same song. Um, I, in, in sort of rehearsing on She Speak the Language, um, I, had, I didn't know what Adam was going to be doing with the hi-hat sort of thing. And then when it finally came to fruition in the studio, it was like, oh, that's pretty cool. It's different than we had rehearsed a little bit, so it's a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm continually impressed by everybody in the band and, and what they do and how every time we make a record, everybody shows up a better musician. But, um, you know, a lot of the times Hunter and I are, are working from demos that are pretty well realized. There's like a lot of production already in there. So um, there were a couple songs where a lot of the bass was more like pad, like synth type stuff. So um, I'm impressed with what Hunter did in conjunction with that stuff to sort of carve out a space for the actual bass guitar. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a, an interpretation of, of everything that the song is doing, and I think you nailed it. Let me also just say that, like... Yeah, come back to me. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, major props to Jade for doing an amazing, like, amount of production on all these songs before Thank we you. went into the studio. Yeah. That's actually... Um, I'm glad you brought that up, because I wanted to ask that about how far along are a bulk of those songs before you start uh, you know, really hammering them out and making them into studio tracks because there's a lot of fun stuff. Like the album opens with sort of this um, uh, like fuzzy, dirty like synth line that I was looking for. I, did, I don't know if I heard it in other places within the album. I feel like that's one of the only times I heard that particular sound. And I'm wondering, did you find that along the way or did you early on know that track needed that sound in there? Uh, and just talk a little bit about yeah, where they're at before you start. I mean, I am just an inveterate tweaker in a good way, not the bad way. Um, and I just, so I'll take a song and I just put layer, layer, layer and just really arrange and rearrange. And so, but when I bring it to the whole band, you know, I expect everyone to do, you know, they're great musicians. So they're going to do, they're going to add their, their stuff to it. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be even more elevated. But, you know, Dark Snow, the first song on the record, that's the, the kind of odd man out. And it's a synth driven song. And it's like the only one on the record that's very synth driven. So I knew I wanted, it's got you know, Depeche Mode meets kind of a rock band vibe. So that synth line, I kind of let my guitar take a back seat and made it be about that synth, which I'm glad that you noticed it because it was meant to be noticed. For sure. No, totally. Um, how do you know, because uh, 
played in a bunch of uh, shitty smaller bands, and we've produced our own stuff before. And one of the hardest things when you produce yourself is knowing when you're done, because you don't have that other set of ears, and you're saying you're an infinite tweaker. How do you how do you set that bar and be like, all right, this is it, it's time to go? Or do you have to just... That's like the day that we enter the studio. I'll never be done. Yeah. I mean, I, I listen back to stuff I do all the time, and I'll be like, oh my God, why did I do that? Why didn't I do this? Yeah. I'm never happy with it. I'm always thinking I could have improved that. Well, uh, we're just about at audience Q&A. We're going to go there in one second, but I do uh, just want you... You guys are playing Terminal 5 tomorrow night, right? Yeah, we everybody are. Got, everybody got, who's going? You going? Yeah. Cool. Uh, I just want to get that plug in there for you. Wouldn't be hey, doing thanks. my job if I didn't. All right, let's go ahead. We're going to turn it over to the audience. we got some mics in the room. First one is right there. Hi. Hello. Um, Hello. So first of all, I wanted to say that my mom is a huge fan of you guys, and I've been t I've actually bringing her to the Philly show. So she's excited about You're that. You're trying to say we're old. What? Sorry. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> hmm? <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, and I've been talking to other people here that say their parents are also huge fans of you guys. We're old. So, no. <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> it's not the reason, I promise. Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering what you think it is about your music that kind of unites people from so many different age groups, so many different musical spheres, backgrounds, et cetera. Well, I think... Part of the answer lies within the question in that we come from so many different musical backgrounds and we have so many different influences. We share them, but our influences are very broad. Um, and also, we're, there, there's an honesty to what we do. We really, really enjoy what we do and we don't release anything that we don't believe in and we really do truly put ourselves into the music. And I think that appeal doesn't require any specific generation. I think it requires a certain type of person and a certain type of listener to um, find that appealing, but uh, it, it, spans, it spans decades. I, yeah, I would say, uh, just as a fan, like I think one of the things, just to add to that, if I may, uh, is something we talked about earlier, and it's that, that you guys have evolved over the years and you dance in so many different sandboxes and play with so many different genres like, uh, whenever there's a band that you can easily label and go, oh, that's a punk band, or oh, that's uh, a whatever band. Like, whenever it's that simple, that band tends to have somewhat of a harder time like having that mass appeal. But you guys, it's harder to put a label because you do so many different things, and I think that helps you uh, bring in all these different fans together, and you get a fan base that's pretty uh, awesome. So Yeah, we're very lucky. Yeah, mm -hmm. Awesome. Next question. Uh, continuing with the theme of making you feel old... Um, I've been a fan since I was 11 years old. Wow. I'm going to be 27 in April. Wow. Um, and I just wanted to say that one of the major things that continues to attract me to your work is your transcendence. You're not artistically static. You're never stagnant. You're always evolving and developing your sound and style while still having the ability to remain cohesive. I don't think a lot of artists can say that, and I think a lot of people can agree with me on that. And um, I just wanted to know, is that something that you pride yourselves on? And is that something that you find to be purposeful? Or is that just you being authentically yourselves? I, I, <clears throat> thank you, first of all. That, is, that was a very kind, very kind words about us. Um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't believe we pride ourselves on that. Um, I don't, I personally, I don't really think of pride involved, being involved in what, in what we create. Um, <clears throat> however, it is, it is something that we aspire to just very naturally, as we had spoken of before. It's, it's something that we are inclined to do, being that um, as if we begin to repeat ourselves in creation, it just becomes boring for us. And so as, as we grow as people and as we, as we grow as writers and as time passes, things change and um, you know, different things fulfill us and we need change to fulfill us and thereby you see, you see that growth. And when people appreciate it, we really greatly appreciate it because we know, um, you know change is oftentimes scary. And throughout the years, we were, would release a record and we'd lose some fans, but we'd always gain more fans. We were very lucky for that. Um, I just spoke for everyone. I don't know if I, <laughs> it's probably wrong. I totally disagree, but it's probably wrong. <laughs> awesome, I think we, uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, uh, hi, uh, thank you so much for everything you do for the fans. We are all really grateful that you still do these Q&As and these awesome shows where you play these deep cuts. I was just wondering if there's anything that you guys see as thematically binding this record. Like I know that you mentioned that Blood is a lyrical 
thread, but you know, Crash Love had all these themes about fame. So I was wondering if there's anything about the Blood Album thematically that you see. <clears throat> Again, um, I'm, I'm, I've said this before, not today though. I'm very lucky to have the the luxury of uh, allowing, being allowed to express myself as I wish through lyrics. So in these lyrics, um, it's returned more to the personal, socio-political um, vantages that are seen on Crash Love are, are really limited to that album um, in the extent that they're seen on that album. So again, this is kind of a, sh a snapshot of, of what's going on with me at the time, now being the time. But the themes that that tie in this record are those of um, connection and m the need for connection and human connection and the misperception of connections that may or may not be there, identity, misperceived identities and such. And um, blood, I feel, is ev evocative of those themes and is evocative of many other different concepts to different people most of which can tie into the, the greater themes that run through the record. So those, those are a few, there are more that, um, that really flow through the work. Well, uh, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a fantastic record. Congratulations on it, thank you for it. I, I gotta let you guys go. Tomorrow night, Terminal 5, all right? The record is out now. If you don't have it, get it. Obviously, we have it, so get it again and get a friend to get it. Guys, join me one more time in thanking AFI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.